Good afternoon and welcome to our first Women's Diversity Leadership event of 2021. I'm Christina Kent and I will be your hostess today from the West Chapter. Our theme this for this event is developing self and uh, developing others. Joining me today, we have four wonderful women and we get to hear about all of their exciting journeys on how they got here today. But first, we're going to start out. But first, we'd like to share a video with you, um, and this is about mentorship and equity takes work in the workplace. Enjoy. This video is about 10 minutes, so sit back, relax, and enjoy. Thank you. I remember walking into my dining room to say goodnight to my parents one evening in high school. They were huddled over my aunt's nursing exam books, helping her study for her placement exam. Now this exam was a huge deal because if she passed, my aunt would then get her nursing certification, which would help her be able to get a job and to afford to save up to bring her six children and husband from the Congo to the US to escape civic unrest. My parents poured hours into making sure that she understood US test structures. And great news, she passed, and her family has been in the United States for over 10 years. Now, I know most of you are thinking, that's amazing. Is this the fastest TED Talk we've ever seen? <laughs> but, <laughs> but I share that because, yes, it is remarkable. But for me, that was just a regular Tuesday. As a first-generation American whose parents immigrated from absolute poverty in the Congo, this was a daily occurrence. My parents are an exquisite example of mentorship. They have this beautiful combination of tough love and compassion that motivates everyone around them to be the best possible versions of themselves. So you can imagine after having a lifelong example of mentorship, my surprise when I entered corporate America. Actually, let's go there now. So let's fast forward to my early 20s, second corporate job ever. My background's in tech, which is predominantly male. I would see my male colleagues go out to beer or play golf with leadership and come back with these insider tips that were incredible. They would know which jobs were coming out in the next four to six months, what skills they needed to refine in order to be considered for them, and who else they should talk to within the company to build up their network of advocates in case they weren't in the room. So seeing that, I thought, yes, I need that too because I'm going places. To my surprise, however, when I would speak to the same leadership and go to coffee or lunch, the advice I received was to smile more, straighten my hair, buy a designer handbag, and wear high heels. And this is not a ploy for gasps, this is a real story. One of the highest paid partners in the company I was working for gave me that advice. Designer handbag and high heels. This is where I quickly learned about a problem in corporate America that is oftentimes talked about behind closed doors. Navigating the old boys club in corporate America is a game of chess. And while men have been taught to play chess since they were basically in diapers, women have been told to smile and play checkers. Today I want to talk about two topics that I'm extremely passionate about, mentorship and workplace equity. But first I want to share a pet peeve of mine. I'm CEO and founder of a tech company called The Mentor Method. We're in the mentorship and workplace inclusion space. And because of our innovative solution, I'm brought on as a keynote speaker or on various panels. Do them all the time. A few months ago, I was on a panel for women's leadership, and it was great. The energy was absolutely infectious, kind of like the room right now. Everybody was nodding, everybody understood. My fellow panelists and I are sharing statistics such as how, despite the fact that women make up 54% of the workforce, only 29% of us are in leadership positions and only 2% of us are CEOs. The audience understands and inevitably, someone raises their hand and asks us how we became leaders and influencers in the space. Nothing frustrates me more than when one of my fellow panelists responds with, I don't know, I mean, I just worked really hard and I followed my passions and $300,000 just came to me one day. I, I don't know. There is definitely a path from $30,000 to $300,000. <laughs> How 
However, it's not overnight. It takes a lot of hard work. And when people in a position of influence who have been able to achieve that don't share the how or the what that it took to get there, I find that tragic. I'm immediately brought back to being that 22-year-old receiving advice of buying a handbag with money I don't have and just going to these women's events, praying for an ounce of experience from somebody else that can help me navigate my own career. Another pet peeve of mine is when speakers come up on stage like this, talk about a problem, and then get off the stage without giving you any sort of solution. So I wanna leave you with four tangible takeaways that I hope you go out into the world to be examples of mentorship. The first is to be vulnerable. This one is hard, which is why I put it first. It's something that I'm actually working on with my own mentors still. But that's where the real transfer of knowledge and experience can happen. With my mentees, I share how, in a five-year span, I went from being an entry-level graphic designer, scrounging for change in the back seat of my car, just to get enough gas to go to work, to making six figures and leading teams for Fortune 500 companies. That took a lot of work and some very painful experiences. Do I like reliving those on a consistent basis? No. But I know that by going there, the young woman sitting across from me can now learn how to navigate her own landmines and get to leadership even faster. My second point goes out to our male allies. Gentlemen, as you know, women are strong. We are resilient and we are capable. But in this fight for workplace equity, we want your voice and we want your help. A good example of this is Mark Benioff. He's the CEO of a huge company called Salesforce. He's poured millions of dollars into closing the wage gap within his company. He's taken it a step further and does not attend meetings unless 30% of those attending are women. For those of you that don't have millions of dollars, this still applies to you. If you see the inner workings of an old boys club, either on your team or the company you work for, call it out immediately. Bring more women into the fold and see your business grow exponentially. Now for my third point, let's piggyback on the Salesforce story. Do you know who brought this problem to Mark's attention? A woman named Cindy Robbins, president and chief people officer at Salesforce. Sometimes there's this fear that there can only be one of us at the top, that somehow being the only woman on a board or the only woman in a team meeting is this badge of honor. I think that's absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> I see it, instead of being a badge of honor, I see it as a sign of your power and a sign of an inc incredible opportunity to open the door and bring more women into the room. You have to remember that when you advocate for other women, it's not a handout, it is a yank up to change the culture that makes you feel like this is somehow a sign of pride and being a token is some badge of honor when it's not. My fourth and final point is for everyone. I want to encourage you not to wait. Summer 2017, I had the most incredible interns. These three young women came from different schools and they immediately banded together, understanding that if they all did well, each one would walk away with an exquisite review, which I provided because they shared insider tips with each other for how to be the best possible versions of themselves and their exact roles and responsibilities. I share that because if three 19-year-old undergrads can do it, everyone in this room can do the same thing. Remember that your story, where you are today, required resilience, it took grit, and there is a woman out there that has yet to navigate those landmines that wants to learn from you. You don't have to be a CEO of a Fortune 500 company. Look at my parents. You can be two intelligent immigrants who understand that tough love and compassion build pathways to opportunity. Go out into the world today Share your voice, share your experience, and be an example of the proven power of mentorship. Thank you. <laughs>
Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. So I'm happy to have joined me today some wonderful ladies. I have Isela Cornejo, Wendy Funkhauser, and Leah Moreno, and Sophia Johnson. And I'm so excited to hear your journeys and for us to just really talk about some of the um, topics that came up in that TED Talk today. All right. So, Sophia, would you like to go ahead and start? Tell us a little bit about yourself, please. Sure, sure. So uh, my name is Sophia. And I've been with ISS now for six and a half years coming up. And I'm not going to lie, I call it my first big girl job. I started it in my mid, mid to late 20s. So this is my first big girl job. So I feel like I'm learning every day. I started off as an office manager. Well, actually, I started off as a call center rep for a position that never came to fruition. They were proactively hiring for it. And I was really fortunate that my i was able to display my talents through my knack for technology and that was like an immediate value add that i was able to bring to the account so i got really lucky well i, I i'm really fortunate i want to say i'm fortunate um <laughs> i want to say that i'm fortunate that i was able to even showcase those talents so they wanted to keep me even though the position never came to fruition so I, that's when I got the opportunity to become an office manager at one of their remote sites. Now I was the only person there. So I had a struggle with trying to make my presence known with everybody and trying. So I, I was constantly raising my hand. Hey, come visit me. Look what I did. You know, constantly trying to showcase all of that. Um, eventually I went on maternity leave and I don't know what happened, but my office went away. Mm -hmm. And I was in my maternal panic, like, oh, my God, what's happening? My office is gone. What's my job? Uh, then I moved and became the facility coordinator. And after that, while I was a facility coordinator, I was fortunate again with my knack for technology uh, to build the intranet site on the GoDaddy account known as the core. And that got showcased, Wade, Wade Lewis uh, was, brought it out there and showed corporate who's like, we need that up here. And I got relocated to San Antonio, joined the IT team as the SharePoint specialist. And I have most recently taken on, so the Pulse is done, it pretty much runs itself, marketing took it over. Um, I managed the service center for a little while on an interim basis. I got to relocate it to our colleagues in Mexico. So it was a great opportunity for our region to kind of bring everything, our services together, right? Using that one ISS strategy. And I most recently, now that that's done, I have most recently uh, been promoted to client solution specialist joining the commercial team. And I finally feel like I get to have my opportunity to be customer facing and do exercise those muscles that I haven't had to use yet, like presentation and not just, you know, on PowerPoint, but of myself. So <laughs> I'm just super excited to be here. And, and that's, you know, that's my journey. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for all your work on the Pulse because, oh my goodness, it is so helpful and we use it every day. So thank you for that. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> garbage in, garbage out, guys. So don't forget that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Isela, would you like to tell us a little bit about your career? Please? Yes, of course. Uh, my name is Isela uh, Cornejo. I am a food service manager at uh, Guggenheimer with Gilead um, in Poster City. I've been in uh, with Guggenheimer for about 15 years now. Um, I started as a uh, cashier in a coffee shop um, at Stanford. So it, we had a lot of different people from all over the world. So talking to them, making them coffee, make them feel comfortable and hearing all, all, all of these stories from them, you know, the backgrounds and we had so many backgrounds. So I kind of uh, figured out that I like that kind of atmosphere as customer service and, you know, that path and Eventually, um, I went to the catering department, uh, helping out, um, and that was me looking more into the food service now, you know, like real life, like real. So looking at the food, the presentation, how we have to deal with customers and food and all of that. So later on, I was um, promoted as a supervi supervisor, um, for the catering uh, and then, you know, 
I got to like really feel the pain. <laughs> <laughs> like really feel the clients on you and my, I'm just kidding <laughs> no but you know all of that what it's involved with uh, customer service uh, catering and, and just being uh, there for the client the, their needs and all of that so and then after that I was again uh, moved to another account um, here at Gilead um, so I was a supervisor in the coffee area and after that, um, I was interested more into the manager role, right? And and I had a really good GM, really good um, um, female GM. So she was just like, uh, "Let me let me see what you can do, right?" And I was just asking her questions, and she was like, "Oh, you're a fast learner. Let me teach you this. Let me teach you that." And eventually, I was sent to another account to a, to a specific unit where I was assisting the GM as the supervisor and exposing myself into the manager role and you know just getting those challenging moments with employees you know having been in charge of the employees and experience it um, on hand you know really needs of the all the uh, the accounts, the vendors, uh, what I need, what I don't need, um, getting help from my um, my great, great, great group of um, uh, food service managers in, on campus. So I had a really, really good support from them. And, and eventually I was sent to the program of MIT where um, you get to have this program so you can become a manager. And here I am. Awesome. Yeah. Well, you're a fantastic <laughs> manager and we enjoy working with you every day. Yeah, thank All you. All right. Yeah. Leah. All right. Well, um, my name is Leah Marino. I started with ISS four years ago. I left the mining industry, working most of my career in the mining, uh, dealing with scaffold builders. Uh, going from mine to mine and and uh, leading those teams of, you know, 90 union scaffold builders. So that got to be tiring and I wanted a family. I wanted to move into something that was less all men. It somehow ended up in facilities. So <laughs> um, applied at a position um, and my resume was botched when it was loaded and I got lucky and the gentleman wanted to... Um, interview me for a financial analyst position uh, within our IFS division on our Adidas account. So that's how I started there. Worked as a financial analyst and he realized really quickly that I had some skills in other areas. So I moved up as a commercial manager, helping to drive and teach the gentlemen on our teams how to understand the language of our contracts, how to um, merge the contracts to the finances, to the operations, and how does this all connect at the end of the day? So it really helped us. And then I ended up, that worked out well, and we had a position fall, fall in my lap on the same account as an operations manager. So, and, you know, it was just that trajectory and the projection of my career that now has led me as an FMS manager, same account, but running a new work stream and um, helping to develop our technology to meet the needs of our team, make sure we keep running in the right direction. So it has been a whirlwind in four <laughs> years, holding four different titles and you know, being given several opportunities that I probably wouldn't have gotten had I just been sitting in the mine wait for someone to come to me. So I have to say, very mm -hmm. blessed to be here and glad to be a part of this panel. Awesome, well, thank you, Leah, and congratulations on your recent promotion. Thank you. Awesome. All right, Wendy. Hello, yes. Well, my um, career with Guggenheimer started about five years ago, um, always in client services, so always thinking about client retention. Uh, before I got to Guggenheimer, I started in the regular restaurant business like so many of our colleagues. And so I ran uh, restaurants for the Patina Group. I was a training general manager. Then um, I left the industry for a minute to raise little kids, came back, joined the, you know, this, the food service business where you have kind of a good gig unless you do catering where you work Monday through Friday. I, I joined the team that worked catering. So that didn't exactly work out for me, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> 
and then um, and so worked for uh, the Compass Group for a you know for a decade and ran um, you know all the West Coast museums for the Compass Group. Took another break for these these little kids that then were teenagers, and I felt like I wanted to have another another uh, stopover in my career to kind of manage them through what I thought was a critical age and then landed here at Guggenheimer and it just no looking back. And I have to say that, um, you know, I, I've gotten to take the skills of thinking about customers from, you know, being a server, right. And just always thinking about service. And I have to say that one of my favorite things about being, you know, in client retention is that it doesn't really change. Maybe we think about different things, but it's just this idea of, you know, continuing um, the notion of service throughout my career has, you know, made it completely, completely enjoyable. And, uh, and here we are. Fantastic. Yeah, full circle. Well, I'm glad that you're here because mm -hmm. uh, having that connection with our clients helps us all. So mm -hmm. thank you. <laughs> all right, ladies. Well, thank you all so much for being here. We really appreciate you being here and love to just kind of get into our talking points um, from the video and kind of going back to what Janice had to say. Um, so starting off, um, let's talk about vulnerability and what that means to you. Leah. Okay. So that was a loaded question when I first saw it, right? Um, yeah. I try, you know, in an industry that we're in, we try so hard not to seem vulnerable or we've always been told not to be vulnerable. It's a weakness. Um, and so for me, I always, I looked at it that way. And then, you know, entering into the leadership, I realized that that's actually something that was my strength. Um, having other male leaders alongside of me and knowing that they are not as comfortable, believe it or not, in speaking to each other and that they find it much more comforting or much easier to speak to a strong woman who is vulnerable enough to understand that they have families and other things as well that they need to connect with you. So that has actually become a strength of mine rather than a weakness now is to say, I can connect to you. I'm approachable by all means, you know, nothing, nothing behind this door cannot be said. You're in a safe environment and it has been something that has helped me in my career tremendously. Fantastic. Sophia. No, that's, that's a great point, Leah. I just want to add to that is that, you know, to be vulnerable also means that you don't have to be a superhero all the time. I, I'm team make yourself more human. Um, I think one time uh, one of the ASL team members they visited and they saw like one of the ceiling panels were out. He was like, you know, I really want to get on the ladder and go fix it. I said, you absolutely should. Uh, <laughs> because when other people see you doing the work of our first line employees and you're way up there, in the senior leadership team, like that makes you more human, more approachable. Immediately, somebody can connect with you just by watching you doing this simple human act, right? We are, you know, being above nothing. Don't You don't have to be strong all the time. It's okay to talk about your struggles. It's okay, especially when it aligns with somebody who's looking to you as a mentor. It's okay to say, man, you know, I, I can totally feel you on that. You know, it, and allowing that safe space and that open conversation is just, it's amazing. Awesome. Wendy. Um, I think, you know, everything that, that everyone else said, and I, I think for me, if I think about what being vulnerable is in the workplace, it, you know, it's two, there's two sides of it. And I think what's interesting about one ISS right now is that we're, we're taking different divisions and we're working together more. So right now, for me personally, being vulnerable means asking a question that everyone else in the room knows except for me, right? <laughs> right. And so I'm gonna, you know, I'm I'm gonna be vulnerable or and brave, which is maybe another way of saying it. And so when I do that, there there are people across the room or on camera. Now we're all on camera where you'll see the openness to support and answer the question, and then others that are just like you know, maybe not so much. And so you can feel that, right? Mm -hmm. And so I then will just flip it and say, you know, as leaders in the company, and we are all, you know, we're all colleagues and, and uh, to each other, 
you know, giving everybody the space to remember that not everyone knows the knows the answer. And so when someone asks a question, you know, being really open with your colleagues about whatever it is. And that I think is such a gift to each other. Absolutely. Isella? Yeah, I, I agree with Wendy. And, um, you know, just putting yourself out there and really uh, don't feel bad if you ask questions. Don't feel bad if you make a mistake. You know, don't feel bad if um, if your employee saw you making a mistake. Uh, they need to understand we're humans and uh, we're not perfect. And uh, uh, we just, you know, just like like anybody else and, and not not to be shy. I, I think, you know, to just be you and 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 just show that show it show it that you're vulnerable and that that it's OK. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much, ladies. So the second point that Janice talked about was uh, about male allies. So with some of our male allies on the call right now, what what do you think, what kind of advice or what is it that they can do to help better support their women colleagues um, within our company? I think listening, listening <laughs> to us. <laughs> <laughs> listening and, and, you know, just, um, I think just be there and, and understand and um, understand that we're trying to juggle home and work and, all of these other stories, maybe, you know, having co private conversation with employees and being being that person that, um, you know, I, I just understand what we're going through with, like, our surroundings. Right. Um, I don't know, you know, sharing parenting, parenting there is. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Sophia. Okay, I'm gonna get a little bit um, me on this on this statement, and I'm gonna say, uh, uh, don't talk about it, be about it. I watched an interesting video on YouTube. It talks about an ally versus an accomplice, and I thought it was a really interesting distinction. And the difference is, an accomplice <laughs> has action, right? So you have your allies, or this common definition of an ally, but she put it as an ally is somebody who definitely cares. The, the, the will is there. The desire is there. The heart is there. They do the research. They have all the statistics. They can speak educated to a point. But when they get into a conference room and you can see that your female colleague has something, I mean, 90, what, 80% of our language is nonverbal, 85, some ridiculous number like that, right? So you can see when something's up, right? Mm -hmm. So if you know that a female colleague of yours has might have something to say, you know, but may not feel empowered in that moment, if you see something, say something, you know, help lift that, you know, make a mention. I mean, one of the things that stood out for me when I built the Pulse, I wasn't even paying attention to what I was doing. And when I was building the capital projects page, I shared with the leader and he was like, can you make the picture more inclusive? Like, it's just a bunch of male engineers. And it's like, oh yes, that's right. Females can be engineers, right? And it's like, <laughs> he corrected me. And it's not, so it, it's, it's a great like action, right? Just if you see something, you say something, whether it's in a conference room, whether it's in an email, if you know something, that bystander effect, don't let it fly. You have to say something. Action is the most necessary way to grow. I love that. I love that so much. Leah. Um, you know, this one I struggled with before. Um, I say struggle because, again, we deal in a predominantly male environment. Um, food service, facilities, um, even janitorial to a degree, we deal with a predominantly male environment. Uh, so for me, I would like to say, gentlemen, the only suggestion is just please look past the fact that we're women. That's really it. Um, include us as if we would be included in anything else and long hair and a skirt or a pantsuit or, you know, anything. Um, Please look past the fact that we are women and that behind everything, there is a brain, 
there is someone who has innovative, creative ideas, and this person can share secrets just to with the best of you and run probably just as fast and hard as you. So please don't ever underestimate the fact that we are women. We are here and treat us just the same way you would treat any other comrade. Absolutely. Wendy? <laughs> um, well, let me say this. I First, I want to just, you know, um, celebrate the fact that, you know, this company is doing all that we're doing to even think about it, you know, and that's huge. And as a person who is on, you know, the, the later part of my career, I'm not just starting. So I've been around for 30 years. Um, it is, you know, it's just so exciting that we're doing this. So yay for that. That's exciting to me. Absolutely. Um, but I guess for, for all of, all of them, uh, you know, all of our colleagues who are men, you know, I feel so, in, in, in ISS Guggenheimer, I have never felt marginalized as a woman. I have, you know, I have really had such a good experience. And I think that largely it's maybe living in California. So I think that there are some things that, you know, make it possibly easier on, on me personally. But I guess I would say for others, um, just some consideration and space for, for women, for all people, right? That we have kind of our professional lives, we have our personal lives. And so just giving everybody space and consideration um, about their career and just wanting to understand more, being curious. And then as, um, you know, Sophia put it, you know, being that, you know, being that supporter, but being that active supporter. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like we get that a lot here in this company. So I wanna say kudos to that. But just just space and consideration is what I would ask for more of. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, thank you, ladies. I loved all of those. I love the be it, say it, say it, be it. <laughs> Did I say that wrong? <laughs> all right. Perfect. It's going right. to be on the pulse here shortly. Watch yeah, out. I can't wait. <laughs> this is going to be a banner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. So just moving on to the uh, a little bit more challenging question, I think. Um, but just really want you ladies to just be honest um, and open with this um, again. Um, have you experienced work, workplace e inequity? And how so? And how did you navigate through that? Who would like to start? This is a big one. I'm going. All right. I'm getting Leah. it out of the way. All no. right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, um, there are several, several different experiences that I've had in my career in, in all different facets. Um, but I'm going to speak to COVID and what's happening now. Um, I have actually felt that less inequality has happened since COVID responses. Um, it is more forgiving. And I think, Wendy, we kind of brought this up before even the panel started. It's more forgiving to have your children interrupt on a call. Um, and for us women or single women, such as myself, where you have no one at home to hush the kids and kind of corral them off into another room and you don't have, you know, anyone to hurry up and mute that call or do those types of things. It is nice to see the opposite of that inequality now where beforehand, you know, men was easier. They had their wives to just take care of it and do what you've got to do. And it was not as accepted for a woman in a business position or in a role of leadership or executive C-suite to even have, I mean, that to happen. So I have to say kudos for that to be the opposite. Thank you, COVID, for that. However, um, it is very live in most, in most women who are in our front line who do not have that ability and it is not forgiven. And so I want to say or speak for them on their behalf that that is an equality we have is that a woman in her life, whether she's frontline or all the way up to the leadership position, it's not equal to men. Um, she still has her family to take care of and maintain and still has to deal with those things. So just want to call that out, not just specifically for myself, but kind of right from the front to the back. Absolutely. It's a great point. Sophia. Hey, I think two is my lucky number. I've been second this whole time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were not uh, just... <laughs> No, I like it. It works. It works. It's like it's a sandwich. It's right in the middle, you know, so it's all good. Uh, <laughs> all right. So, and, and, it, and I had trouble defining whether or not, honestly, this was workplace inequity per se. But I think that as women and, and in the workplace, even, uh, we have a tendency 
we can get pigeonholed based on a specific set of skills or an immediate shine that you might show. And I think for me, that quickly became, you know, technology. Now, when I when I came to this role, when I came to ISS, don't get me wrong, like when I went into, when I pulled into the GoDaddy parking lot from this job that I had no idea about, like I didn't know what I was walking into. I walked into this job and I was like, oh my God, it's GoDaddy. And my inner nerd was like totally out there and, and don't get like, Technology is something that it's a skill set that I have, but it's not something that I necessarily want to do with my life. I don't want to be a developer. I don't want I, will, I don't want to be a graphic designer or anything like that. Right. I always envisioned myself as a businesswoman, as a negotiator, as a person that is, you know, uh, I think I'm charming. I mean, I think sometimes I'm an acquired taste, but I think I'm, I think I could be a little bit charming. So I think I can, I think I can win a room, you know, and, and do what these, you know, men are out here doing and, and charming the pants off of somebody, you know, I can play golf, by the way, I can play golf. <laughs> this is a real thing. And, um, you know, so I, I felt a little bit pigeonholed, you know, in the technology field and I move, I, I have always raised my hand. So if I hear like something is coming, I was like, I'll do it. Like that's always been me. And so really how I navigated through it and still navigate through it, I, I first and foremost in my new role that I, 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 and if anybody even says the word technology to me, I'm almost running away from it. I was like, I cannot, I can't do that because if I do that, then people always have a tendency to come for me, come to me for this. And if you work at ISS, you know that that's not my job is the quickest way to get out the door, right? So it's not that I don't want to help. I do want to help, but I don't want to be continue to be perceived as, oh, this woman has a great future in technology when I, Sophia, don't want that for myself. Mm. So I think that you know, navigating through it is standing up for yourself. Like nobody knows you better than you know yourself, period. If you know down in the pits of your soul that something you want to do something, you better get your butt out there and do it. Like, <laughs> period. Like, yeah. and, and that's kind of how I've been able to, to get where I am today. Absolutely. That's a great point, though. I mean, you have to be your own self-advocate for sure. Absolutely. Isela? That's great, Sophia. Uh, well, I don't have a lot to say on that. I think I've been really um, lucky and, you know, I've been like, just not really relate to, to this because I've been lucky enough to just go on and and really have people that support me and, and not really deal with what Leah was saying, but I uh, totally understand her point and I totally agree with her. There's a lot of single moms out there that, you know, that men don't necessarily need to, to be the mom. They kind of run away from it. So <laughs> <laughs> they're like, okay, <laughs> goodbye. No, but you know, it's, it is true. And I agree with Sophia and Leah. Awesome. And Wendy? Um, so in terms of, you know, the question is, have, have, have I experienced workplace inequity? And so I will say that I have experienced workplace inequity and, you know, being kind of, a, you know, a person of privilege, I'm a white woman. And I think that, so even for me, my experience may have even been less than others. And I'm really, I'm, I'm really aware of that. And so early on in my career working for another company, you know, there was just, you know, Sophia talked about being pigeonholed. I was pigeonholed to do a job and I was really good at that job and I was valued at that job, but there was going to be nothing else. That was it. And if I wanted to be promoted, if I wanted more out of my career, I absolutely needed to leave my company. And I think, you know, we, um, you know, from the previous sessions, I think, you know, someone had the, I think it was Adriana. She just said, you know, just say yes. So, I mean, I had to say yes to me because I wanted more out of my career. And so I had to say, yes, I had to leave because, you know, there, there wasn't really even a path like that exists today to do something about it. And so you do have to make choices as a person who is being marginalized in whatever way it is, right? 
um, to, to say yes to yourself and, and put yourself in a place where you can grow. And, you know, so that's, that's one thing. And, and, and I did it and I'm thrilled. And if anybody is experiencing something like that, that's why I think we're talking about mentors. And I think we want to make sure that people have, you know, access to have those conversations to help you figure out what are your next paths if you're feeling, if you're feeling that way. Um, but the next thing that I want to say is that also as a leader of teams, you know, in my previous life and being um, a female and having working in kitchens where all the chefs were females and the men would walk in the kitchen and be like, oh, all of these lady bad, bad chefs. And then they had to walk in and sort of feel that way that maybe all of us have felt mm -hmm. that was modestly satisfying and i think there are people on this call that know what i'm talking about um but and so but i will tell you it gave me a perspective again um to ensure that everybody has a lot of space not to feel that way so while that's kind of a little bit of a funny story to talk about the reality is it's 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 all of our um role to make sure that everybody is is feeling you know welcome and and included and um, nurtured in the workplace. So that that's a for sure thing. And now I think we can take it to an, the next level, which is, you know, having that conversation about making sure that there is pay rate equality, you know, and it's not just about a position, but maybe now you've got the position. And so what, how, as a woman, are you paid versus a man? And that's, I think, that next level of conversation that we're ready to have in 2021 and beyond. And we were probably ready to have it 20 years ago, but we're really going to have it. And certainly I know that in this company, we're doing something about it. And those are some just exciting things that I'm thrilled to be um, part of this company for those reasons. Absolutely. Absolutely. Such exciting stuff happening. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. All right. So the last question we're going to get into is around mentorship. And so I know that we've been talking a lot about mentorship. I know that we're starting some programs around mentorship. So uh, just what in your eyes, how do you feel? What do you think that it, uh, it takes to be a good mentor? What's some of those qualities that uh, maybe others, if they are looking for a mentor, should look for? Wendy? Well, I think, first of all, it's somebody that you can, you know, identify with. And either because you be, either because they're totally different than you. So I guess somebody that you could connect with is, is a better word that I would say and or want to connect with. So either somebody that's completely different than you or has a different set of experiences with you because you want to want to do something else. And I would say in our company, if 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 I were a person just entering the entering the workforce in our company and I was a new leader, I would very much want a mentor in a segment that I didn't work on in, right? Because it is all about connections and helping, you know, you with a path of not only your career path, but just navigating, you know, different sets of people and, and, and those are the things. So I guess for me, I would think career path, what do I want to do? And then maybe have a mentor in that space, but then also just make sure that you know you you connect, right? And I've had a mem I've had great mentors, and then I had one that were just like okay, and so and it's okay. I would give everyone on this call who is in process or thinking about a mentor. It's just okay if the first one that you try doesn't work, and it doesn't mean that mentorship doesn't work. It just right. means that you just move on to the next one. Right. Right. Well, not to well, go out of order on the last question, Sophia. <laughs> make sure you stay over to me. Yeah, got it, got it. Got it. yeah, I mean, I'm on a roll. I love it. <laughs> uh, so let's see. So, uh, so what I look for in a mentor is actually I, I, I'm pretty self-aware of what my weaknesses are. I'm not necessarily afraid to acknowledge them. I think that's how you, right? First step is acceptance, right? In anything. So... For me, I always look for, I take my weaknesses like, oh, wow, that guy is really good at that. And I just kind of want to be closer to that person. Now, I think that I've, I, I wouldn't say that I've necessarily had a mentor at a, an official capacity, right? I think that, you know, as far as a quality of a mentor is concerned, I think that empathy, compassion, um, and, and uh, uh, investment investment is big you know it's not a word it's a relationship it's 
you making this this acknowledgement that you want to invest in this person's growth and success and help them and use your own personal journeys also to help them learn a little faster. I mean, I always look at my parents. It's like I had a very quick lesson. Love my parents. They're great. But I had a quick lesson on what not to do when I became a parent, because there were some things that I remember how I felt when I went through them. And I'm like, I would never want to bring that to the next person. So I think mentorship is like that. It's like, you know, I felt this pain in the workplace. Let me help this person try and navigate around that or push through it or whatever that looks like. You know, I think that's important for a mentor. Uh, but I've been lucky to have great bosses. Um, yeah. And, I, I, and I, I don't take jobs for jobs. I usually take them for my boss. So when I have, you know, I, I was like, yeah, no, you're like really strong where I'm weak. So I want to work under you and learn, learn from you and, you know, even have the additional challenge of adapting to you, personality type. So I, you know, for me, that, that's what it is. <laughs> awesome. All right, Estella. Okay, yes. Uh, so mentoring, um, I have, I had like Sophia great mentors so far. Um, Christina is one of them. Uh, but yeah, I have uh, Jeff was is was one of is still is one of my mentors, even if he doesn't know that. <laughs> but every time I talk to him, there's always something to learn, right? He, he's he's full of full of wisdom. <laughs> uh, but you know, uh, a good listener, they're good listeners, um, being flexible to teach, I guess, to share your skills, your knowledge, um, to to be there and, and, and just be respectful of somebody uh, that doesn't know or if, you know, that if I'm asking questions, you know, um, be respectful that I am asking you because um, you're a mentor, you know, to me, and mm -hmm. and it's important to, I guess, to to know that if somebody's coming to you and asking you these questions, that's because they look out in a way, you know, they know you, you know the answer, and they want to learn from you. So I think it's one of the things that I look from um, for a uh, from a mentor, um, and be able to give a constructive feedback, you know. Every time we we do something that maybe is not right, or um, it's but it, when it's great, you know. Also, so you know, give the feedback, an honest feedback. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you, Asella. Leah. You know, I'm I'm actually currently I have a mentor, and please don't everybody get jealous here. But Ann Mosier is my mentor, um, <laughs> and. You know, I'm really blessed, but I have to say I don't give her what I need to be giving her in my mentorship because of work, right? You get too busy and you give yourself all these excuses why, and then you don't really stop until you've hit a brick wall. And you're like, oh, I should ask my mentor that, right? So for me, the only, the only thing I can give to anybody as far as constructive criticism is to take advantage and plan and plot it out. Don't let it hit you as soon as that brick wall has hit you and you're like, oh, crap, I need, some, I need some help now. It's don't be afraid to say, hey, I'm coming up on a project or I'm coming up on something. I don't know how to navigate this. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, uh, I think that's one of my biggest my biggest critiques for myself is, is fear of people looking at me and going, she doesn't know what she's doing, right? And then you got to ask your mentor and then you look like a dummy. So again, let go of the fear, allow yourself to plot out what you're going to deal with with your and how you're going to do it with your mentor and then truly stick to it because it's very hard. We all get busy. We all have stuff we have to do and we forget that again, we're not taking care of ourselves and we lose sight of that mentorship. So definitely make sure you're planning what it is that you're trying to get out of it, so you don't you don't waste their time or your own. Absolutely, I totally agree with that. All yeah. right, well, thank you. That's all the questions we had, but I wanted to just open it up to see if anybody out there had some questions for our panel. So we'll just give it a minute or two to see if anybody has any questions. Any questions? Did you all have any questions for each other? I mean, I asked all the questions here, but I know we just all getting to know each other. 
You know, I really like the comment that Wendy said about, um, you know, when she faced inequality, being able to say, hey, yes, I care about me. I really love that comment. Sometimes we forget ourselves in our careers. We give everything to our company. We give everything to our team and we forget what we're doing or why we're truly here. So thank you for that comment, Wendy. That really hit me home or hit home with me. Awesome. Fantastic. All right. Fantastic. Your mentor giving kudos out to all of you. Great job. Thank you. Well, I would like to thank you all for joining us, ladies. Thank you for your time and to everybody that joined us out there. Um, I know that your time is valuable. So we appreciate you all being here today. And we have a short video, very small video that we will send off, um, send you off with. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> I'm going to try to say this without getting really emotional, but I'm not really sure what my life would look like if it were not for Shonda Rhimes. It's hard to describe the impact that Mia Hamm has had on my career and life. Sophia Coppola. Kim Hume. Nina Lederman. Jenny Connor. Venus. She has so much power, but she wields it so compassionately and responsibly. She supported my work and she made me believe that I could do more. I was outside of my comfort zone, but I had the safety net of her support. The women I work with are everything. One of the most heartening parts of this past year for me has been the outpouring of support I've received from women. The idea that another woman was in some way taking what belonged to you, that whole idea is kind of shifting. Together, we can get to equality. Together, we can raise our voices. Together, we can stand up to anything and anyone. Together, we can make the workplace a better place. Together, we are funnier, <laughs> smarter, more ambitious, braver, badass, bolder, invincible unstoppable when women lean in together we accomplish amazing things let's lean in let's lean in let's lean in together we are all on the same team learn how you can support other women today at leanin.org together